Hey guys, this is Generation Blue, Madness of the Generation Lightning here, welcome back. And for today, I'm going to do something a little bit different. Different being that if you can tell by the title, I've been working on a original English light novel series. I've been working for some time now, and that's one of the incentives for my Patreon. You can see chapter 2 there, and I'm still working on chapter 3. I'm quite the perfectionist, so it's taking me a while to get these chapters rolling. But I hope you guys enjoy, and as a bit of a preview, because I don't have that many people on my Patreon at the moment, so I thought I'd just have my phone just read to you the first chapter. And if you wonder how I got this idea for this particular story, let's just say last summer I had this very bizarre dream. When I woke up, I was... Typically, most people would probably forget their dreams because they get back to reality quickly. But me, since I live in fantasy most of the time, this particular dream stuck out to me, and this is the result. So without further ado, let's begin. As soon as I figure out how to get this thing going... How I Became a Magical Girl, Then Another World's Hero by Jeff Magnus, Book 1, Elements of Reality, Chapter 1. How I Became a Magical Girl, it began as a typical day for a gaming content creator. Playing the latest game inside and out with an impartial mind so that he'd get a full understanding of the developer's intentions for the target audience. This particular game being the game was similar directed for a female audience. He was having fun until his older sister entered the living room of their shared apartment with the following yeah, that's right story. again. I found you a job. How I Became a Magical Girl, Then Another World's Hero by Jeff Madness, Book 1, Elements of Reality, Chapter 1. How I Became a Magical Girl. It began as a typical day for a gaming content creator. Playing the latest game inside and out with an impartial mind so that he'd get a full understanding of the developer's intentions for the target audience. And despite this particular game being a dating sim more directed for a female audience, he was having fun until his older sister entered the living room of their shared apartment with the following statement. I found you a job that caused him to raise his left eyebrow. Define, found, sis, you'll be joining my company as her newest representative. Come again, Jenichi Mizuhara, 30 years old, was not quite an eat, not by choice anyways, but due to a visual disability he'd had since junior high that had only deteriorated further over time made finding and keeping a job for any length of time quite difficult for him. That only became harder after a worldwide epidemic caused social distancing in which most stores had shut down, though a vaccine was made to counter the epidemic that had taken almost three years for the world to return to a somewhat normal state like how life had been prior to the natural disaster. But the three-year time frame was what would be the driving cause to the world later refer to end of the incident. Said incident was when what had been a minor corporation declared themselves as the world's first evil organization and unleashed artificial monsters upon the citizens. Since the monsters were prototypes, the local militia was able to fend off the attack and force the organization's retreat. That victory had only lasted a month. When the second attack occurred a month later, the organization's monsters had received quite the overhaul to resist conventional weaponry. A town in southern Japan fell under the organization's control by day's end. Fortunately, some monsters had been taken captive from both attacks and had been examined by the nation's best scientists. Essentially, since these monsters had been man-made, the government had determined the best way to counter the upcoming monster attacks from the numerous evil organizations popping up all over the country was to create a man-made solution. Said solution was the creation of heroes and magical girls. Monsters had been discovered to have an artificial organ that channeled their supposed life energy to fuel their supposed supernatural powers. It was soon discovered that, through technological assistance, humans could also channel their own life energy to fight off the monster attacks. Thus how the government and private corporations began establishing careers for volunteers who chose to fight against the monsters, which was how heroes and magical girls came to be. And readers may be wondering why Genichi was giving a world history review and breaking the fourth wall. That would be because his older sister, Aka, had found him a job at the private company she worked at, when he knew the only open position was reserved for a magical girl. Sis, you do remember that the job you signed me up for has the word girl in its title right? Aka rolled her eyes dismissively at my sarcastic comment. I don't see what the deal is. You like magical girl anime, don't you? Genichi could swear his left eyebrow was twitching quite a bit at that moment. Just because I like watching the genre of anime doesn't mean I want to be one. Plus, need I point out the fact that I'm a guy, even though you secretly crossplayed as a senshi that one Halloween. I was seven, and it was hardly a secret since you tricked me into it. 
And yet you've kept the costume secretly stored in your closet all these years. It was custom made and expensive. It would have been wasteful to throw it out. Still doesn't mean I want to be a magical girl. Your large manga, anime DVD, and figurine collection of numerous magical girl franchises says otherwise. Your collection back in high school surpassed even my old classmates who was a hardcore fangirl, which is really saying something about your preferences. Arg. Leave me alone. Fine. I'll go to the freaking interview. Just don't get mad when I'm rejected. Trust me, why who won't be rejected? Sir Director isn't really picky about applicants right now. Frankly, Genichi had always thought Sir Director had gotten his name legally changed to suit his current position. He highly doubted the man's parents had essentially chosen his future path in life by literally naming their son Sir Director. Why is that? Genichi was quite skeptical now as to why Eiko thought he'd be so easily employed. You'll find out tomorrow. And with that parting statement, Eiko left the room, presumably to get ready for work. Well, that certainly wasn't ominous whatsoever, Genichi muttered to himself as he got back to playing the dating sim game on his handheld console. Tomorrow was going to an interesting day. The following morning had Genichi waking up earlier than he usually did. He typically attempted to wake up around 7.30 a.m. and be out the door by 8 a.m. for his morning hour-long walk for both exercise and to get his mind going. But today he was getting up an hour earlier so he could not only take a hot shower, but catch the train to his destination. This wouldn't be the first time Janichi had visited his older sister's workplace. She was one of the company's executives and had given him a guided tour of the public venues within the main building some time ago after she'd been promoted. Which was why when Janichi entered the entrance reception hall, he was recognized by the secretary on duty and quickly ushered to the elevator and directed towards his appointed office meeting on the upper floor. So then, your Ika's younger brother, the Sir Director, as he preferred to be called, greeted him as he entered the luxurious office that clearly only a fanatic CEO would ever care to decorate so elaborately. If the many posters dedicated to heroes and magical girls on the walls were any indication of the man's tastes, Genichi gave a small smile and bow of his head in greeting, Yes sir, I'm Genichi, good to finally meet you in person, while Genichi had visited the company a couple of times. He'd never had an encounter with Sir Director before today due to the man's erratic schedule that prevented even other executives from seeing him often. Not to be rude and cut the pleasantries, but we'd prefer to get you right to work and out in the field as soon as possible. Why is that? It was at this point that Sir Director's demeanor took on a more serious and professional aura, which Janichi noted as he reflexively straightened up in his chair as the man spoke. It's been kept quiet. But many private companies have stepped up their recruitment for heroes and magical girls over the past month. Us included. What's with the secrecy? I don't recall hearing of any monster outbreaks attacks recently. Not to mention, he didn't recall Aka mentioning any new hires to the HMG positions or said position becoming vacant before she had approached him. I wish that were the cause. Dealing with monsters would be infinitely easier than the media. Genichi couldn't help but shudder in sync with the older man at the mention of the unsatisfied vultures known as the press. The secret is that numerous heroes and magical girls across the nation have been disappearing without a trace. Our first and previous hero vanished just a week ago. Genichi then got an inkling of the situation at hand, and with fewer people available to fend off monsters, the evil organizations may get bolder in their operations. Exactly. In an attempt to maintain the balance of power, recruitment for heroes and magical girls have been restricted to certain numbers in every region. But with so many disappearing as of late, we've had no choice but to call in fresh recruits. And since Aka works here as one of our top executives, she put in a good word for you. The younger male in the room still had a concern to note. She did mention my visual impairment. Right. His concern was literally waved away, and quite dismissively as if said concern was completely irrelevant. That won't be an issue. Our latest transformation model setting will give your transformation form perfect 2020 vision. I in addition will be a flawless figure, immune to diseases, intuitive combat instincts, basic movement knowledge, the works. Genichi hummed as he mulled over those details. Well, that certainly sounds enticing. Wait, hold on. Define that part about a flawless figure. He wasn't so sure if he cared to have a physique, flawless or otherwise. That could attract the attention of guys who would be staring at said figure, much to his current and future chagrin. Just thinking about that already had Genichi unconsciously shivering with dread and disgust. Maybe this was how girls felt about guys gazing at them lustfully, not that he ever had with his vision making that task a near impossibility. He just substituted with adulterated manga. His concerns were again dismissed via hand wave as Sir Director continued on. Indeed. 
So then, Genichi, can we count on your help? The man inquired as he gave the younger male a hopeful glance. Genichi let out an exasperated sigh at being slightly ignored before his mind went over the offer, then hesitated. Unconsciously using his right hand to play with his raven black short hair on the back of his head. On one hand, the fact that he would have to wear those costumes magical girls wore in public to fight monsters would be embarrassing as hell. But on the other hand, he really wanted to finally have a stable means of supporting his family who had essentially taken the care of his everyday needs for years now and he desperately wanted to pay them back like with a five star dinner or maybe even buying them a new house at some point. If he had to be embarrassed daily to support his family, then his choice was clear. I accept Sir Director. Sir Director clapped his hands enthusiastically, whether in excitement or anticipation was unknown. Wonderful. And here's the transformation device. Genichi accepted the offer device, then noted what form it had been crafted as a bracelet. He noted, were you expecting fancy ones? That amused twitching smile was back or something like that. Yeah. So do I have to say some cliche transformation phrase or something to activate this thing? Honestly, he was hoping he wouldn't have to call out a phrase related to makeup like in a certain popular anime manga series. Not exactly. See that blue button on the right side? Simply hold it down T, and it will record whatever you say to both register your voice as its user as well as use what you want the transformation phrase to be. So I gotta choose. Huh? I'll have to give this some thought. Frankly, he was relieved his most recent concern had been negated, and while you think about it, let's get the paperwork out of the way. I though Aiko already took care of it. She took the liberty of filling in the relevant fields for you. Yes, but we still need your signature on a number of forms to make your employment officially recognized by the company. Corporate policies and procedures. Understood. Let's get him out of the way then, Genichi replied as he let out a small sigh of resignation. He knew the importance of documentation. But it was still such a pain to deal with visual impairments be damned. Eager to get into the field, Sir Director's lips were twitching upwards in a clearly amused and perhaps even teasing smile. It was then Genichi remembered the particulars of what his new job entailed. Maybe we could take our time. He said a bit hesitantly, Sir Director let out a hearty laugh. No need to be nervous. The bracelet is programmed with everything you'll need to know to be comfortable in your transformed state, as well as the knowledge of how to navigate in your new body due to its different physique. Plus it will function as a means of communicating with the comp anyone you're out in the field. Quotation mark. Now that it was being brought up, Genichi did wonder how he'd even be able to perform his expected duties as a magical girl when he didn't have the first inkling of how to move in a female body due to a girl as center of gravity and various physical attributes being vastly different from a boy s. Though now his concerns were how his new accessory would apparently stuff his mind full of female information and how they would mix with his dominant male mind. Unfortunately for him, his musings couldn't last as the paperwork was swiftly signed and filed. And without further ado, he was sent out to patrol. So patrolling is just me aimlessly wandering about the city, Genichi muttered to himself 15 minutes later as he walked down the busy sidewalk, came swinging side to side as other pedestrians made way for him. On a provided headset, Sir Director chuckled over the communication device. You'd be surprised how many first. Timers complain about how boring the hero and magical girl work actually is since about 80% of the work hours are spent patrolling their company's jurisdiction area without any incidents occurring. Since you're still getting paid to patrol, you have no right to complain as it was stated in the contract. Once I transform, those complaints could be translated into whining, which was not covered in the contract, Genichi rebuked. A cheeky grin on his lips that could essentially be heard over the communication link. The grin quickly disappeared as a thought came to him. Although, shouldn't I have trained my new abilities first before jumping into a possible confrontation with monsters when I have no combat experience? Genichi could literally envision Sir Director again waving his concerns even over their call. From what I've heard, you're quite adept with combat from all those games you've played over the years. Nerding out on video games while having a visual impairment has no comparison to real life combat. He deadpanned. I believe I may have left out some crucial information in regards to your transformation and the form you will soon take. Heroes and magical girls get their power and bodies from their own mind. The form you take will be based on whatever shape you envision and your abilities will be based upon your own thoughts, including accessories and weapons. Genichi couldn't help but let his mind wander back to the numerous anime he'd watched and manga he'd read throughout his younger years as a potentially ideal magical girl formed in his mind. Same height as his own self at 5'4 feet. 
dark blue hair tied into a ponytail that hung slightly the shoulder blades that framed emerald green eyes and the face of 16 year old magical girl. She was dressed in sky blue colored cocktail length jack that was zipped in its center with said zipper length extending to just above the navel and thus opening the rest of the length of the jacket up. A black band decorated the jacket from the top of the shoulder to about where the zipper stopped, thus ending the decoration with a golden swirl on either side of the zipper in a symmetrical pattern. Actually, he envisioned a somewhat mandarin color for the jacket where the golden decorations at the end of the black stripes were a cluster of three golden thin ovals connected together at the top where they fastened to the stripes. Lower down beneath his envisioned jacket, due to its opening nature, would reveal a pair of black shorts and black thigh-high boots. And despite the jacket having long sleeves, the hands could be seen covered in black gloves of the same shade as the shorts and boots. At a glance, the outfit would be considered plain and nondescript for a magical girl outfit. However, Genichi was a realist when it came to combat and had no delusions of wearing some fluffy knee-length skirted dress that obscured as mobility. Plus he'd gotten the inspiration for this outfit from his favorite magical girl anime from his childhood that involved the main character going around capturing magical cards. His fantasizing was interrupted as his new wrist accessory began to emit an alarm-like sound that apparently was also heard by Sir Director over the call link as the man said, a monster has appeared in the nearby park. Go intercept it. I hope you've thought of a good transformation phrase. He hadn't really given that topic much thought really. Call him a pervert if you want. But Genichi's thoughts had been prioritizing female fashion over a catchy henshin phrase as they were known as. But considering anime obsession, there was a phrase at the back of his mind that he decided to go with, placing his arm into a ready position and using his other hand to hold down the required button. Genichi called out, or a release. White light exploded from the sapphire gemstone embedded into the bracelet that quickly enveloped Genichi within the next second. Time seemed to slow down as he could literally feel his body being molded into a new form as well as new clothes materializing into existence on his new physique. What felt like minutes passed by in a literal second. The lights faded, revealing Genichi in her new magical girl form. She blinked a few times in an attempt to get her bearings. The world looked so different now. No longer was her sight blurry or a narrow peripheral sight. No more sensitivity to the sun's bright rays. Everything was clear, both near and far. She could actually read everything from the discarded sign next to her feet to the electronic board across the street. Tears began to swell up in her now green irises. She couldn't suppress the happiness now bubbling up in her chest. It may not be a permanent solution, but she now had perfect vision for the first time in over two decades. But before her another thought could cross her mind, she heard screams and shouts in the distance. And she was reminded as to why she was now in her current form. The new girl took in a calming breath and remembered what Sir Director had said earlier. Her thought controlled her new abilities. As long as she kept a collected and clear mind, she should be able to do what was needed. Without further ado, she leaped out of the alley she had ducked and ran onto the nearby building's roof. Following the signal on her bracelet, she began roof hopping towards the indicated park. All the while, the new magical girl took in the sheer delight of feeling the wind brushing against her as she performed the acrobatics she had only dreamed of for years. Her newfound fun ended two minutes later as she arrived at the park and easily spotted the culprit responsible for the current chaos. She couldn't help but feel a sweat drop fall on the back of her head. The reason? Apparently her first monster opponent with a giant monkey, said giant monkey was in the process of raiding an ice cream stand of all its banana flavored desserts. So rather than doing the cliche introductory speech, the new girl decided to utilize her current aerial momentum to deliver her target a powerful kick to the head. Now the kick monster roared as he skidded about 10 meters away from the stand. Thankfully dropping his merchandise back onto the stand before he was sent away. The monster clutched his head in pain as he glared around him in an attempt to locate the offender. Who did that? I did? Was her reply as she landed gently a fair distance away from her opponent but still in the line of sight. Fortunately her opening attack had conveniently moved the monster into a more open plaza-like area of the park where most of the citizens had already been evacuated. The only ones that remained scattered around the area's perimeter were brave observers and some inconspicuous reporters. And just who might you be little girl? She paused. Between coming up with her current outfit and transformation phrase, she really hadn't considered a title for herself. Come to think of it, she had spent the last few minutes avoiding to identify herself as her male name, since Genichi was not a name one normally associated as a girl's. While she bristled at the little girl comment, she did in fact have a name in mind from years of nerding out on anime merchandise. I'm Magical Girl Violet Aura, the new estate magical girl in the district. 
Now was the time for the newly minted Violet to strike a pose that had her pointing at her opponent in a Yumainuous target manner. It was a rather subconscious decision. If it was possible for a monster to sneer, the giant monkey was certainly doing an impressive impression of doing so. Huh? As if a newbie can defeat me, Gorilla Bongo. I'll snap off your head and arms and use them as my newest drum set. The newly Bongo growled in a deep male voice as he raised his thick arms up and flexed them in a threatening manner. Such an action may have been imposing to a fresh teenage girl on the job, but Violet was a 31-year-old man now in a 16-year-old girl's form. So she was far from intimidated. If anything, she found the monster's overly macho act amusing. As interesting as I'd like to see that, I prefer my limbs exactly where they currently are, so no thanks, Mr. GB Monkey. It was amazing how quickly a sneer could morph into a deep scowl. You did not just give me a lame-ass nickname. I am Gorilla Bongo. Violet couldn't help the smirk tugging upwards on her lips as she taunted. Whatever you say, banana brains. Are we gonna do this or what? With pleasure. Take this, Gorilla Rocket. Whoa. Violet yelped as she leaned backwards in time to see Bongo's arm literally hop it over her. She then quickly jumped upwards and did a somersault midair also in time to see Bongo's arm boomerang itself back around return to its owner. Okay, didn't expect a gorilla monster to be equipped with rocket punching tech. How vexing, so you managed to evade my opening volley. Try this, fireball barge. Violet reflexively shot her left hand out and envisioned being her newfound energy surrounding her with a protective shield as she called out. Reflection, upon her command, said barrier materialized, thus blocking the incoming fiery projectiles. What Violet hadn't expected was for some of the projectiles to not just bounce off her shield, but her redirected back towards their original user, forcing Bongo to evade the deflected attacks. Hmm, not too bad. Newbie, the monster grudgingly grunted. Violet clapped her hands together and focused, there's more where that came from. Not it's now turn to attack. Sir Director had told her that her thoughts controlled not just her abilities, but her weapons as well. Utilizing magic was one thing, but she knew her newfound magic couldn't take out a monster at the moment. So she'd need a weapon to deal the finishing blow. And what was a better weapon than a larger than necessary sword? Grinning, she focused on conjuring her new blade into existence. Spreading her palms apart caused energy to appear between the blade and the weapon took shape. She quickly grabbed it in her right and twirled at her person before stopping in an offensive stance. Only to pause as the light around her new weapon dissipated to reveal a staff. Violet couldn't help but openly gape at her hands that now gripped a completely different weapon than the one she had envisioned. She was certain she had been thinking about a sword, so why she now wielding a freaking pole that lacked any sharp blades capable of slicing the giant monkey into sashimi? Unfortunately, Bongo took notice of her dilemma and his cockiness returned in spades. Newbie didn't get the weapon she wanted? Too bad, cause I'm coming to fulfill my promise of ripping your head off. He roared as he charged forward, not having much choice. Violet held her new staff up and dashed at her oncoming opponent. Take this, she shouted as she slashed the staff in a sideways sweep, hoping that she could use the staff just like how a certain other game character who wielded a blunt key like sword could. Unfortunately again, her hopes were for naught as the staff struck Bongo. And while he grunted from the impact, it was clear he had taken minimal damage and his earlier smirk was now a grin as he took pleasure in batting Violet away as though she were a fly to be swatted. Huh? Your defensive maneuvers may not be too shabby, but you're sorely lacking in the offensive department. Or did no one ever tell you a staff isn't meant to be used like a sword? Crap. Violet thought as she got from her landing spot, the transformation may have given me a basic knowledge of how to maneuver in this body and how to use basic magical defenses, but I don't know a thing on how to wield a staff in combat. And it's not like I can just whack him to death. Or can I? Now it was her turn for a wide, almost sinister grin spread across Violet's face as she held her staff up reminiscent to a base already stance. It's mad time, Bongo go. Prepare yourself. She then channeled her magic and visualized the shape she desired. Within the next moment, the upper end of her staff sparked with energy as a large mallet head materialized. Gorilla Bongo's eyes widened in both shock and horror as he realized just what the new magical girl had in mind next. Whoa, Mo, wait just a sec, he cried out as he backed away and waving his arms in front of himself in a warning gesture and hoping of keeping the possibly psychotic girl at bay. Not a chance, monkey. Violet then channeled magic into her legs before performing a dashing maneuver at the monster. But before she reached her target, who was about to strike her in retaliation, she jumped upward via a somersault in preparation to strike her now startlingly confused monster from behind. Eat this, or a hammer. 
A loud crashing and smashing sound echoed across the area as Violet's downward spin created a large crater in the dirt. She took in a few deep breaths to recover from the adrenaline rush the battle had created. Also taking a moment to wipe some sweat from her forehead, she dissipated her technique and gazed into the artificial hole to see the flattened remains of Gorilla Bongo sparkling with electricity. It seemed this monster had been created with some kind of engine in place. As Violet jumped out of the crater, she heard the cries of many people. Turning, she couldn't help but let her eyes widen at the now large crowd of onlookers that had remained to observe her debut battle. The cries of joy soon turned to shouts of warning. Violet quickly turned back around in time to see Bongo slowly making his way back up, his body still sparkling dangerously. The gorilla let out a moan of pain as he gave Violet a look that said he accepted defeat. You've bested me, newbie. I may not have been in this world for long, but I enjoyed every minute of it. Before I meet the end, I have a final request. Violet gave the monster a curious look, wondering just what a dying monster's last desire could be. What is it? She regretted that inquiry as Bongo's gaze became lustful. I'd like to fondle your innocent form before I meet my end, he declared loudly for all to hear. There was quite the pregnant pause in the vicinity as empty air swept by around them. An unfamiliar feeling of annoyance combined with disgust filled Violet's being her left eye began twitching uncontrollably. She could only guess that this was feminine fury that fueled her as she let herself move on autopilot to quickly close the gap between them to deliver the final blow. Not a chance in hell. You perverted monkey. She roared as she delivered a swift kick with all the energy she could muster, launching her target skyward. As Bongo let out his final wall cry of having no regrets, he promptly exploded the following second later, thus renewing the crowd's cheer signaling her victory. Violet let out a tired sigh. Relieved the confrontation was over and let her staff dematerialize, presumably returning to whatever subspace pocket dimension it H.A.D. originally come from. She'd have to grill Daisuke later as to why she had gotten a staff instead of a sword. She then noted, that from the debris that had once been Gorilla Bongo that had fallen to the ground, a G-Lowing sphere had survived. Curiosity took her over as Violet walked over to pick up said orb. As she examined the glow wing object in her hand, the sapphire gemstone on her bracelet began glowing as well. Before she could react, the glowing orb's light seemed to synchronize with the gemstone as it was absorbed into her bracelet with the glowing lights dying down afterward. What was that about? Violet mentally wondered. Making a mental note to give her brother-in-law another inquiry once she got back to the company headquarters. Her musings were cut short as a voice called out to her. Thank you miss, for saving my stand. The man who had been stationed at the ice cream cart said to her with a bow. Not used to being thanked so graciously. Violet couldn't help the blush that covered her cheeks as she stammered. I it was nothing. Just happy why I could help. Regardless, I really am thankful. The man straightened up. Then grew wide eyes as he gazed behind Violet. If I'm familiar with how you heroes and magical girls work, I'd advise leaving now before you are swarmed, following the man's gaze. Violet too saw a sight she had been dreading. Numerous reporters charging at her, their many notepads, microphones, and cameras at the ready to record whatever gossip would likely be placed in that night's news. You're right about that. Take care of yourself. And with a slightly panicked wave, Violet once again took to the air as she used all the agility she could muster to quickly root pop away from the park and back to the company. She didn't quite care if she had left a number of disappointed and irritated reporters behind. An hour later had Violet finally back at the company building, still transformed. She had initially planned on dropping into an empty alleyway to turn back only to discover she had no idea how to reverse the transformation. On top of that, the public had already caught wind of the battle that had occurred at the park and were patrolling every look and cranny of the city in an attempt to get a word with her. Funny enough, she had evaded most of them by running along the sides of buildings, since roof hopping had attracted the reporters and helicopters. Honestly, she found the media to be a bigger threat than the monsters by the time she collapsed into her seat in the company's main laboratory. Aka, Sir Director, and her brother-in-law, Daisuke, were present. Daisuke served as the company's chief scientist, though his talents mainly focused on the neuroscience fields, which explained how Violet's transformed state had acquired its needed knowledge. And just what does all this techno babble have to do with why I can't reverse the transformation yet? Violet grasped, unknowingly pouting unhappily while crossing her arms under her newfound chest. She was truly emulating a petulant child at that moment. Daisuke seemed to have anticipated her current mood, for he seemed completely undeterred as he spoke, basically. You used up most of the energy you had in your fight against Gorilla Bongo. Then the rest was spent during the trek back here. 
Since you haven't recovered enough energy yet that is necessary to activate and or reverse the transformation, you'll be stuck that way for a while. Fine. Violet grumpily accepted that Ria's owning for now. Though she still had other concerns to air out. So why did I get a staff for a weapon? I was envisioning a sword. Her brother-in-law tilted his head upward and rubbed his chin as he thought over the situation while verbally brainstorming his thoughts. It's possible you were actually envisioning a staff. No. I'm pretty damn sure I had a rather oversized sword like a certain spick my haired blonde guy uses in my mind at the time. The Neo Blue Net rebuked. He wasn't faced one bit. No. The transformation doesn't just observe your surface thoughts but rather your unconscious thoughts. Those take priority. So you must have been unconsciously wanting to wield a staff much more over a sword. True you wanted to wield a sword at the time. But that was not what you truly desired deep down. She gave him a skeptical look. I don't know how that... I've always liked swords all my life. And that right there is the key difference. You said you've liked swords all your life. Not loved? Since your passion for swords may have been more of a hobby, your consciousness made a different realization when it came time to create your weapon. Nothing I can do on that. Sorry, Violet held any interest for Daisuke's enthusiasm at the moment. She just wanted to revert back to her original self, go home, and enjoy some gaming before calling it a day with a light dinner. Instead she had to endure Daisuke rattle on about how well she had performed utilizing their company's greatest product to date, among other things. She could understand the guy being proud of his work, but she was just too mentally and physically exhausted to care at the moment. Fine, then care to explain what the heck this thing is. She said as she managed to navigate her bracelet settings to retrieve the glowing orb Bongo had apparently left behind. Everyone else in the room seemed to perk up at the sight of the orb. So Violet surmised it was important. Uh, so you retrieved the monster core? Sir Director noted with an approving nod. Well done. Glad we don't have to tell you to go back to grab it. We kind of forgot to tell you that before you fled the scene. Upon hearing the name of the object, Violet gave the orb a scrutinizing look. So these cores are like the hearts of the monsters we destroy. Essentially, yes, Daisuke agreed before continuing, but they're more like their central power source. Remove a monster's core, and they will simply stop functioning after a certain amount of time. We're still researching on ways on how we can make use of the monster cores we recover. This is why your transformation bracelet was a breakthrough prototype. It can absorb the monster cores and grant you access to new abilities. Now that piqued the fatigued magical girl's interest, Define new abilities, please. She may have been tired, but she would still put up a polite front if it meant getting more useful information. Sir Director did his dismissive hand waving. You'll learn those as you go along. All heroes and magical girls learn new techniques while on the job, so you will as well. It will serve as a good source of combat experience that is far more valuable than simply having you spend hours in a simulator. Violet let out an exasperated sigh. That hadn't answered her original inquiry at all. But it did reassure her that she'd be learning new abilities in due time as she defeated more monsters. So she asked her next question, so when will I be out patrolling again? This time the answer was more prompt than the others prior. Oh in about 3-4 weeks, she gave Daisuke an anchor deal a look, come again. He seemed happy to elaborate, believe it or not, but evil organizations tend to suffer from lack of materials and or funds. Because of these setbacks, they tend to only churn out new monsters within strict deadlines. The estimated time for when a monster may, and the key word here is may, be complete and ready to cause havoc is roughly 3-4 weeks, sometimes extended to 5. It varies on what kind of monster each organization is developing, but other organizations could launch surprise attacks at any moment, Sir Director interjected, so you'll be given a set schedule and salary for your patrols. Plus you get PTO on the weekend so the benefits outweigh the cons, Violet let out another sigh. This time a combination of exasperation and relief at this newest revelation. At least she would now have some downtime before the next battle so she could get her bearings. Plus rest was what she needed before she could change back to Genichi. So she announced aloud, in that case, I think I'll head on home to wreck you parrot before clocking in tomorrow. Unfortunately for Violet, Aka had other plans for her, actually. V, the new magical girl twitched upon hearing an abbreviation of her new name. You're coming with me for tonight. Why? Violet took a step away from her sister who M had been suspiciously quiet this whole time and was now giving her a sinister smile quite reminiscent of the one she had given Bongo just before she'd flattened the monster. Her suspicious ions were confirmed and wariness magnified tenfold as Aka's grin widened, for a crash course on womanhood 101. Upon hearing those last two words, 
Violet let her instincts rule as she made a mad dash for the exit in a desperate attempt to escape whatever plans her older sister had planned. Only for her to crash into the steel doors that had quickly slid shut before she could pass through, causing her to yelp in pain as she fell backwards onto the floor while nursing her now sore head. Daisuke, let me out, she cried out to her brother-in-law. Hoping her pleading and almost puppy dog guys would convince fellow biological male would embrace the brother code and take her side. It was not to be, as Daisuke gave her a sympathetic look that told her that husband roles took precedence over brotherhood. Soon Aga had gotten rope from somewhere and had also somehow tied Violet's leg up before she could even blink, clearly so she could no longer run away. That didn't stop Violet from using her hands to grab onto whatever object she should get her now shorter limbs to cling onto in another attempt to delay the inevitable, and thus... Violet Genichi's first day as a magical girl ended with her learning things about the female anatomy that had most certainly not been covered in high school health class that she most definitely had never wanted to know. Among other realities she was now subjugated to by social requirements. Her mind would be scarred for the next several days to come. Regardless, her journey had officially begun and would be continued. And that ends chapter 1 y'all. If you enjoyed, then please pledge to Patreon $1 a month. Other than that, I will see you guys next time. Take care!